Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for, um, for having the opportunity to give this presentation here today. Um, so I have been asked to uh, provide yeah, I've been asked to provide some, uh, some uh, perhaps a, a, a very brief talk about uh, the linkage of climate, climate change and sustainable development. Uh, it's of course a very broad topic, but I think uh, it's very important for our community and the scenarios that we are developing, to which extent can we uh, combine the traditional focus of the modeling that we are doing, very much trying to understand climate mitigation, with also other societal objectives, uh, which deal with sustainable development. And uh, it's double important because of, of course, the two major international agreements which are out there, the Paris Agreement on the one hand and the UN United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, which together, at the one hand, frame uh, the policy context, uh, but on the other hand can help us also to pro provide an analytical framing of how to explore uh, these various very different dimensions, because there are uh, multiple dimensions. We are talking about not only climate, but climate plus 17 uh, different SDGs, and which deal basically with economic, social, but also environmental uh, objectives. And many of those objectives are not global, but local, so it's also an analytical challenge uh, trying to bridge uh, global uh, integrated assessment work on climate uh, with the more local um, uh, distributional issues, very, much in, uh, very often connected to distributional issues in terms of different SDGs. So I would say uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the whole context is provided by uh, figures like this, which uh, most of you know very well, uh, the enormous gap that exists between, uh, uh, if you think about what current climate policy will deliver, for example, from the Paris Agreement in terms of the NDCs. You can see up here emissions ranges across different models uh, um, and uh, extrapolations of the NDCs, and then compared to two degrees and one and a half degree scenarios which uh, require a fundamental transi transition and uh, our models mainly have been focusing about the questions of how to get from where we are on the red side down to uh, uh, the blue and, and, and the green area and this has been I would say the central focus of uh, the integrated assessment modeling for quite some time uh, other people look at this graph and get a different other impression. They say, wow, what a big gap. And what is, if you really try to, to strengthen climate policy that much to get from red down to blue, does this mean something like this, perhaps? <laughs> Basically, uh, will it be possible to, 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 to frame climate policy in a way that it's not... Uh, in contradiction with development policy, uh, but basically allows us to avoid a situation like this, where we push the climate policy side, but at the same time squeeze other uh, societal objectives like the, like the SDGs. And uh, in order to be able to do this, I think it's necessary uh, that we I think about, uh, we can use, as I said earlier, the SDGs as an analytical framing, uh, the big energy, climate, and land transformation is part of it. And then in a very analytical way, try to understand what are the individual linkages between policies in these different areas, but not only what are the implications of climate policies for those other objectives. Do I create synergies? Do I see trade-offs with those other objectives? But also uh, the various and very complex and heterogeneous policies that I see in those other areas, to which extent can they help climate policy or not? And I think understanding this is important also from the perspective of scaling up, uh, scaling up the effort for decarbonization, uh, because if I can identify the synergies very clearly, I can motivate climate policy not only to the lens of, 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 of mitigation. Um, so, I think if we, if we look into what 
uh, sorts of implications are there from climate policy. I think one thing that is not in our models is the enormous benefit in terms of avoided impacts, particularly avoided impacts in terms of extreme events in of, of that that will uh, particularly affect the very poor and a number of different SDG dimensions. Um, and um, I think uh, have the potential to change a little bit the picture and the economics of how we see the cost of climate mitigation at the moment. Uh, so obviously, for example, this is a study that was done by Ed Byers and colleagues where I was also involved. It shows you uh, basically extreme events, multi-sectoral ones, which are connected particularly to five different SDGs. And if you uh, mitigate and if you're able to turn the heat down, this is for example three degrees and you would mitigate and reduce the temperature to two degrees and then to one and a half degrees, you can see quite nicely how the number of exposed uh, population uh, reduces and you can see also that at one and a half degrees still many people are exposed. This is not in our tools actually. And this makes a big difference, I think, also in terms of the, not only the economics, but also in terms of the political viability of the implementation to get this better into our integrated assessment uh, models. Um, and I will talk, by the way, in the last session also a little bit about how investment change if you take some of those extremes into account in energy water land modeling. So some PR on, on, my, on my own behalf. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, so one thing is avoided impact. Uh, I would say the other, big, uh, the other big impact is, of course, this very rapid transformation, so changing uh, energy system fundamentally and also agriculture uh, has implications for, other, uh, for these other objectives. Uh, this is a, a figure that has been put together by Volker Cray and colleagues. Um, uh, from the City Links project and which compares estimates uh, from, uh, from a set of scenarios that try to understand what are the implications for the SDGs um, if you uh, pursue very stringent climate policies. The way to read this graph is that anything above the zero line means an adverse size effect on different dimensions that speak to the SDGs. The color is, by the way, always the color of the different SDGs. And if you see a bar going uh, into this direction, so uh, this, this is a co-benefit. So, which means basically that for in some areas, particularly when it comes to areas like health co-benefits uh, of uh, climate mitigation, we see clear co-benefits with a certain uncertainty range. In other areas, we see mitigation risks, so potential trade-offs with climate policy, and these trade-offs can be quite big. Many of those trade-offs are connected particularly to the risk of hunger, biodiversity loss, food prices, uh, so they are strongly connected to large-scale land transformations and potential conflicts between food production and and land-based mitigation, bioenergy, and related price increases. But there are also other trade-offs, for example, in terms of resource efficiency, if you think about mineral resources of some of the renewable futures that we project in the, uh, in the scenarios. Um, but, the, but in reality, this is, these are various different objectives, and the, and the challenge for us as, an, as, the, as a scientist is this multidimensionality of the SDGs. So this is, um, um, in some of the dimensions, for example, let's look at water. Uh, we have actually um, uh, the, the, the effect on the SDGs will pretty much de be uh, dependent on the mitigation portfolio. So scenarios which show a trade-off are usually those scenarios which rely a lot on very water-intensive technologies like nuclear and CCS while those scenarios that show co-benefits rely on solar PV and wind and, and other parts of the portfolio which uh, consume uh, less water than fossil fuel alternatives. Uh, in other dimensions, it's exactly the other way around. So if you look at uh, the trade-offs uh, for responsible consumption and production and, uh, and mineral resources, Actually, those worlds which project very high solar PV and or wind uh, are creating the trade-off, while those 
uh, those uh, transitions which rely more on the conventional options actually don't have that trade-off. So very often these trade-offs also pull completely into different directions, which makes uh, uh, a multi-objective framing necessary. And what, what makes, I think, the SDGs even more challenging is um, illustrated, I think, very well here, if you think about decent work and employment effects of those scenarios, uh, which very much depends on what do you do with the carbon cycle revenues uh, in those scenarios. So you see negative employment effects if you simply increase uh, the tax. So basically, you, you or reduce the general taxation uh, in terms of recycling. But you can also avoid that trade-off completely if you have a policy design that basically reduces indirect labor costs and uses the carbon revenues to redistribute the, the, the taxes away from labor to, uh, to, to the environmental externality. So this is another layer of complexity here because the trade-off itself depends on the policy design and the implementation. Um, having said that, um, obviously many of the effects uh, that I'm showing in this graph are not directly represented by the integrated assessment models. So the, we, we were able to uh, explore those trade-offs as well as the co-benefits by coupling the more aggregated integrated assessment models with disciplinary models which have uh, the granularity and the representation of those different sectors in order to explore what are the implications of those different, uh, those big transformations in the integrated assessment models. So in this specific case, uh, we, for example, coupled uh, a range of different integrated assessment models with the AIM uh, diversity model to better understand uh, implications for biodiversity. But we, we used also uh, uh, life cycle assessment tools, uh, gains air pollution model, and uh, energy poverty tools, uh, uh, and, and, and coupled those different tools with IEMs. So why do I emphasize this? Um, I'm emphasizing this because I think in order to really have a full SDG scenario with all those elements, I think it will be very difficult to get all those details into one framework. But if we collaborate and couple different tools with, with different strengths and weaknesses to each other, I think there is the possibility to cover many of those dimensions uh, in, a, in, a, in a relatively relatively comprehensive way. There is actually a study in the literature by Helene van Soest from PBL and colleagues uh, which uh, have looked into how do uh, integrated assessment models represent different SDG dimensions. This is a bit of a complex problem. It looks a, a complex figure. It looks into the interactions of different SDGs and how different models represent it. Uh, or not. So if, always if you see uh, a color, then the modeling frameworks on average represent it relatively well. Um, uh, basically, one of the conclusions is that the integrated assessment models uh, do represent energy, climate, infrastructure, industry problems, uh, but also to some extent uh, the economy and some biophysical implications relatively well, but they do relatively poor on, on other on other aspects and therefore need to be coupled to different other tools or, or, or expanded. And uh, perhaps thinking about this uh, a little bit further, uh, and if you think about integrated assessment and modeling and how do we want to better uh, tackle the, um, the, 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 this multi-objective uh, perspective in our tools, uh, I think there are uh, there are perhaps four, four steps necessary here. Uh, step one would be to start to, what, what, what I showed already, but uh, to start to couple integrated assessment models which move to more micro studies, studies that understand something from implementation and that are also operating at the scale of where the SDGs at the end will materialize, which is local scale, sometimes basin scale, subnational scale. A step two, I would say, in this, uh, on this path is to improve the SDG representation in scenarios that we're all using. Uh, so we are using the SSP-RCB framework. 
I think we need to expand the narratives in order to better have a textual description of how different dynamics of the S SDGs unfold in the SSPs. And then we can start to perhaps uh, have model comparison across the SSPs and the quantifications. I'm almost finished. Um, then we can endogenize, I think, some of the critical SDG drivers, and this is particularly about social and spatial heterogeneity. And then ultimately, I think what we wanted to do is so-called to develop so-called STP pathways, uh, so sustainable development pathways, uh, really with a multi-objective framing, uh, with an improved policy design that can cover those synergies and trade-offs. And, uh, and, uh, and help us uh, uh, with a more robust assessment of this climate SDG nexus. Uh, different studies in the past have already tried to do this. Uh, um, let me point towards the world in 2050, a study, uh, this is a community activity on the SDGs, but perhaps my last slide here now, really my last slide, uh, is uh, a pointer towards the SHAPE project, uh, a project which brings together different teams uh, um, the different integrated assessment teams and which is coordinated by ELMA uh, from, from PIC and which has the ambition to develop over the next three years uh, sustainable development pathways as part of a, of a smaller community effort. Okay, thank you. Sorry for running a little bit over. Thank you very much, Kiran. <clears throat> we now have uh, four minutes for questions with Kiran. No questions? No comments? Yes, please. Okay, Juan, thank you very much for your nice presentation. So you talked about the interaction between the climate and uh, the various SDGs, and, and also you saw contrasted the solar and the nuclear and other options. But it, so the, and the, the biggest uh, sort of negative effects are from uh, for biodiversity loss and the other things. How much of it, how much of this comes from it? Uh, the, the BECs, bioenergy with CCS, or is it, I, I mean, I'm asking, so is this speech like one particular option, is this really sort of driving these results, or, or you have other things? Um, you're talking about this bar here, right? Yeah, so, so as, you, as you can see, first of all, there is a relatively wide range of estimates of how big that trade-off can be. Uh, the, the, the scale here, this is a factor change compared to the baseline. So a factor of 10 means that ten, there's a tenfold species loss if you take the land use change that is happening in the models and put that as it is into a biodiversity model that assess, assesses land implications for species loss. Um, obviously, it's very much dependent on not only bioenergy, but also the agricultural, uh, you know, basically for how much do you move from unmanaged land to, to managed land at the end. Um, and the more you can limit uh, the land transformation, the, the, the smaller this biodiversity loss will be. Uh, we are at the moment working on an assessment because um, biodiversity is very complex. It's not only about what is happening with the land, but it's also about how land is connected, right? So the connections between land so that species can migrate is very important. And there are also other, uh, it, what land is converted and so on is also very important. So what we are doing now as part of CD Links, actually this is the last paper, CD Links is a project which ran over four years and has just, com has just been completed. Um, we try to understand uh, what sort of compensatory measures could be there in order to totally eradicate this bar and bring it back here in a biodiversity model. And it seems, when the analysis that we have is still preliminary, but it seems possible. So you can actually have biodiversity measures which limit that effect or eradicate it completely. You've um, <coughs> mapped out a you know, set of interactions that uh, might be expected uh, if we were able to achieve one and a half degrees or two degrees. Um, and I wonder if one of the frontiers might be the plan B, what happens if uh, human societies are unsuccessful in uh, 
achieving the two and one and a half, but take some, some efforts which increase over time, but don't necessarily leave us with the, the, the first best outcome uh, at the end of the century. Is this a question uh, focusing on biodiversity or general, a more general one? In general, looking at the SDG interactions with the particular uh, goal of climate mitigation. Wow, yeah, that's a, very, that's a very difficult question because it unfolds very differently across the different dimensions. For example, in terms of biodiversity, where I'm not, uh, I'm not actually an expert, I'm learning a lot from colleagues at, at the moment, uh, most of the biodiversity losses are actually caused by development rather than climate change. So, 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 so we have also that additional third dimension. And um, the studies indicate also if climate change can be avoided, uh, there is quite a significant benefit for biodiversity loss as well. Right? And we are the sweet spot between those three different, different um, interventions are. So the, the pace of the transition, the avoided impacts, and the development, which causes also stress for that specific bar only, is, is I think, not, not, fully, it's not fully scientifically uh, uh, explored yet. Many other dimensions uh, show very significant benefits, both in terms of climate as well as in terms of the mitigation. And then uh, we, we did... Um, uh, we did also quite some assessment in terms of what it would take to reduce the, the negative side effects. And um, that depends then really on the, on the policy design and to which extent do you have complementary measures in order to avoid, to avoid those, those side effects. But where the balance is between avoiding the impact because of reduction of mitigation or, uh, sorry, the reduction of the impact and the transitional risk, I think this is something that yet needs to be needs to be done, or perhaps if others, I mean that's that's at least my take on it. Thank you very much. Um.